Again, welcome everyone. Good morning. How are you doing? Uh, kind of recovered from yesterday, yesterday's party. Well, I can tell you tonight there's going to be another party. Um, that's going to happen. Oh, sorry, we were already there. That's going to happen here at uh, the Empa Nest Building. That's a living laboratory uh, onto which you can do building experiments and energy experiments. So we're going to visit this building. We're going to have our closing events there. And this is also your chance uh, to visit the DFAB house, which we heard uh, of parts of uh, already in this conference. That's uh, more or less the current state of uh, construction. It's going to be open next year, and this is like a preview uh, which we can arrange for you. So please make sure to not miss the bus uh, right after the conference, which brings us all there. Good. Now, oops, I'm one too far. Yes, okay. Now, actually, in 2008, we published a little book, uh, Fabio, myself, our team. It was called Digital Materiality in Architecture. So that's 10 years ago. And we wrote here on the back, digital materiality evolves through the interplay between digital and material processes in the design and construction. Materiality is increasingly being enriched with digital characteristics, which substantially affect architecture's physics. And I think one decade later, I can see really this field is booming. What we see here at the conference's presentation and at the workshops in the Robotic Fabrication Labor Laboratory is truly mind-boggling. And I congratulate and thank you all uh, for being here and for contributing uh, for this field to really thrive. I think you put in tremendous passion to change the way that we design and build. And this is important uh, in today's world. But as the field is maturing, as we now see finally industry coming into, into play, I think it's also the moment to maybe kind of place a little bit of a reminder. And that's what I quickly want to do before we start the, the keynote. It is true that construction is an important, a seminal industry with a high impact. But construction is not just about business. It's not just an industry. It's not just a set of techniques. Construction is creating, assembling, putting together, molding and shaping the world we live in. It is thinking and making the world as we explore and experience it each day. The way we construct also exhibits the way in which we imagine the world. And in this sense, construction reflects the way in which we want to inhabit the world. It is how humanity makes itself at home on Earth, in a literal sense. Therefore, construction shapes us back as much as we shape it. To me, to design construction, as many of you here actually do, is at the very roots of designing architecture. To design the possibilities for this planet to evolve and to design a building culture for the Anthropocene. This is possibly our mission. It is at the same time a humble activity as it is a great endeavor. And each leap forward, each little step, and each drawback teaches us some modesty towards the grand challenge, challenges, towards the future discoveries, but also towards the great achievements uh, of the past. And what I see here at Robark deeply impresses me, and the, I see your curiosity drives a change that is much needed. And by doing so, it creates a definition a new definition, actually, of what is making sense. I think we create new attitudes and sensibilities, new ethics and the new beauty of architecture all along. So with this said, I can't do more than thank you for being here and uh, that thank you that we do this exciting journey together. So now I have the pleasure to introduce Jonas, uh, our next keynote. Where is he, actually? Ah, oh, okay. Here. Uh, with my glasses, I can only read. So, <laughs> I see you all blurry. Um, <clears throat> Jonas is a highly talented researcher and a dear friend uh, to me. 
Uh, he called himself recently a roboticist in residence at the NCCR Digital Fabrication, which kind of surprised me, but which I take as a token of a true collaboration. Jonas is a roboticist with a deep passion for dynamic control, for machine learning, but also for a very tangible kind of artificial intelligence. Jonas was the Swiss National Science uh, Foundation professor for agile and dexterous robotics here at ETH Zurich, still aff affiliated with ETH Zurich, and recently joined uh, DeepMind's research team uh, in London. At his time at ETH, he was instrumental not only for the setup of the research, uh, in our collaboration, but he was also the deputy director of the National Center of Competence for Research on Digital Fabrication. So you see how robotics was deeply ingrained in the growing up of this successful program. His dedication to the NCCR and to architecture went so far uh, as that he moved his labs actually up here on the Hünkerberg. Um, here he, and also I need to mention his talented team, which uh, he curated and assembled, uh, intensively collaborated to make possible what we claim to be the first in situ robotic uh, fabricator and many other important breakthroughs for the field of robotics and architecture. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matthias, for this very nice introduction. <laughs> well, thank you for the invitation to everyone uh, that was involved in the organization, of course. Um, I also want to give a a special shout out to uh, Orkun, Tanya and uh, Caitlin, who I, I, I'm not sure if you guys realize how much uh, heavy work they do um, in the background to make this all happen. Um, so thank you very much, guys. So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit to give you a little bit of a robotics perspective on um, uh, uh, agile fabrication, what I call, started to call agile fabrication sometimes. And as Matthias said, so basically when I started engaging with Matthias, I think very quickly the idea came up. So what, what does it mean if we really basically start to uh, collaborate between architects and, and roboticists uh, in, a, in a true interdisciplinary way? That basically meaning that uh, I think what the state of the art was at that time is that uh, very amazing, right? So basically the, the architects go and basically take uh, available technology and tweak it and, and hack it and, and make it happen. And they do amazing things with it. So it was always mind blowing to me. But still, you only get that far, right? At some point, really, to, make, to push this further, you really want to basically start to engineer the solutions from ground up. And that's, um, in essence, what uh, we started thinking about and uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit here. So I'm, I'm really, my vision is basically that we can create robots that <clears throat> act on the environment. Um, physically act on the environment, uh, be that by, with hands or wheels or legs. And this is, of course, useful in the context of construction, which we're going to talk about today. But it's, of course, relevant for many, many fields. Uh, for example, also rescue robotics, uh, in which I have been involved in with a little bit, a little bit with another NCCR. <clears throat> and in short, right, we have huge societal challenges. And I do think that, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I do think that robotics is not the answer to it, but it can be a part of the answer. So in short, right, we have basically shortage of skilled labor, substandard working conditions, limited productivity gains in, in, in many important fields, construction, for example, and largely non-sustainable process. So the question is, can we build, create robots that can act, assist, and fabricate on our behalf to help us stemming these challenges? Now, of course, robotics has already been a part to sustain production or productivity, especially in the Western Hemisphere. A lot of industries wouldn't exist anymore in the Western Hemisphere if not for that, right? And now if you look into one of these really highly mechanized uh, production plants, one thing is very striking. You will see the workpiece, which is here a car, is being shuttled through the plant and the tools, the robots, they are stationary. So this is an important principle, you will see this always. And the reason for that is of course that this makes a lot of the engineering for the, on the tool side, on the automation side much easier. And that's, but now if you're coming to what I call manufacturing at large scales, or building large scale structures, and uh, construction industry and the architecture is only one of them, but um, planes and you know, wind turbines and chips are another one. But if you want to do this, this of course comes to limit. You cannot shuttle a house through a production plant, it doesn't work. And what is also particular is that these industries very often are extremely low volume and extremely high mix. So what this means, every one of them, everything you produce might be different. So you have to have highly adaptable 
production processes, so the mass manufacturing buzzword, right? Now, if you look into this industry, you can ask, well, technological revolution has definitely also happened here. So, for example, this is a, is a shipyard uh, about 100 years ago, and if you compare it to today, it looks strikingly similar. Now, of course, if you zoom in, right, you see a lot of technological advances. These guys have cell phones and radios, computers, power drills, and so on. They work off a CAT uh, uh, drawing, and so on. But the large-scale logistics somehow hasn't changed much, and the reason for that is that you have to move the tool over the workpiece because you cannot move the workpiece around. Of course, you can kind of have mechanical support and they can get very big and quite sophisticated. I mean, this is a huge crane in a shipyard, but you also clearly see that this is limited, right? This thing can only produce, come in from the top, so it cannot do any sophisticated manipulation on this workpiece. And so far, really the most efficient and flexible way of getting tools into 3D space are basically humans with a lot of implications on workplace safety and health and so on, right? These are heavy tools, these are obviously dangerous situations. And so the question is, can we do this a bit different? And then, of course, many of you have seen these pictures by now. This is just reflected, looks very similar like in the shipyard, right? So on a large-scale logistics, despite a lot of innovation, things look very similar. Now, of course, especially in this community here, people think about this for quite a while, and there's two ways of which reflect a little bit what we have seen before. One is the large-scale kind of fixed installation, I think, which we see a wave coming out that it really goes into applications and into, into uh, industrialization right now. But the other question is, can we also basically enable fully mobile robotized tools that can go anywhere in 3D space and deliver arbitrary tooling manufacturing capability without too much uh, constraint. Basically, we call this concept the in-situ fabricator. So this is a generic machine, like the fixed uh, robot is a generic machine on which you can put tooling and get it into place. So as I suggest, we should rethink construction as uh, uh, fabrication at large scale. And we have to kind of understand what these are. So I want to basically kind of tease out a little bit what the robotics challenges are in this field. So if you look at this construction site, what is specific about it? And um, what we have seen definitely, and we have been talking about this quite a bit now, the size of the structure built is enormous in comparison to the um, uh, tools that you have. The structure also changes quickly on an hourly basis, but for sure on a daily basis. You don't have a precise control of the environment. It's impossible. You cannot engineer the environment in a way you can in other manufacturing plants. We cannot and do not want to keep humans out. That's a very important point. Then this is another one here, uh, which is very different from other applications of digital fabrication or additive manufacturing. We're talking about performance structures here. We don't want to play, uh, um, basically build little toys that we can look at it, enjoy, and then maybe put on the shelf or throw away. We want to build load-bearing structures, watertight structures, things that stand for 50 years or 100 years. Then, this is very interesting to me because this has been coming up now a lot, and I think this is actually one of the biggest ones. It's all embedded in a huge socio-economic system, so construction is not just about technology or architecture. And last but not least, we want to build architecture. So what does that mean for technology. So we have to think about mobility, how to get the tools into place, how to uh, give them the sensing that they know where they are. Since the structures are changing quickly, we have to have way more adaptation than is traditionally used in uh, automation. Then we have to use much, much more information feedback, and I will come to that. That is actually also an opportunity. Then this is a human machine shared environment. This is not about, uh, Fabio said it very nicely actually the other day, it's not about safety only. There's actually also potential in that, right? But you have to uh, think about this, how you enable this technologically. Then because we want to build performance structure, we have to understand what is a true digital fabrication material system. And I tell you, it's, and as you're going to see in this talk, it's not just a copy of how people have been doing this. You have to really re-engineer the whole material system, including the materials, the mechatronics and the architectural aspect. Then that one, the NCCR is very active also in that, right? So basically, what is the path of rolling this out into the, into the practice? How do we educate future stakeholders? And last but not least, we have to enable bespoke structures and processes. So now I want to um, juxtapose this against some kind of elementary robotic systems function. There's in essence three things that any robot or automation system, whatever you want to call that, has to have. The first one is it has to understand where it is in the world, and it has to understand what it has in front of itself. So we call this sensing or state estimation. You that ter term sometimes, so the where and what. The second one is thinking, so planning and control, what we call it. 
Um, the third one is actuation, getting around, getting things done. And there are two aspects. The first one is tooling, so how to get the process done. The second one is mobility, flying, driving, walking, or just being put there. And then actually surprisingly, right, this might surprise some of you, but standing still can actually become really hard if you're now a mobile machine and you have to uh, deal with that in a technological sense. Then very importantly, those processes have to inform each other, usually on a quite tight timing loop, which limits the computational budget we have and so on. And so basically it's what we call feedback loops. And then we, since we're not only dealing with simulation or, or computer graphics, we want to get this into reality, into materiality, right, as it is called in this field. And so basically what are the nuts and bolts of getting this done? And I want to now illustrate that in the remainder of my talk in an example, so which is the uh, deployment of the in-situ fabricator with the mesh mold process on the nest construction site, which I think is one of the first really complete one-to-one um, -one construction, digital construction, in-situ construction systems. The idea in a nutshell is the following. So you take one of these in-situ fabricators, you go to the construction and you build a metal mesh uh, and with a specific tool. We're going to talk about that. And then this mesh doubles as the formwork. So you're basically filling this with concrete and then you have much less limitations on the shape and you can build kind of nicely shaped, fully load-bearing, um, steel-reinforced concrete structures. Now, in order to do so, as I said, so basically you have to enable this, uh, you have to engineer these bespoke processes and manufacturing, and the tool head, as you all know, is, is basically a key aspect. And just to illustrate basically where it started, was before I, uh, my time interacting with Matthias Norman actually already prototyped the process using a, a but he, so he, he created a little ABS extruder head, heating plastic, right, and extruding a mesh in 3D space where the mesh size is small enough that if you pour in concrete, it doesn't catastrophically flow out. So you vibrate it, it protrudes a little bit, you do a little bit of surface uh, um, treatment, and you have, in principle, a nice kind of singly curved or doubly curved um, concrete artifact. I wouldn't call it a wall, right? So, and the issue with that is, so this is not... This is a nice prototype, it kind of illustrated the idea, the promise of the idea, but it's not ideal for two reasons. Well, first of all, why do we have steel and concrete, right? It's for structural properties, of course, in this community, I guess most of the people appreciate that. The second one is that ABS is flammable, so you will build a, a wall with flammable material, which is maybe not ideal. So you want to go back to steel. Now, this is actually a prototype that came off, right after that where uh, basically we decided, well, okay, now we want to do this really in steel. Norman built this partially with a robot, but partially by hand. And you can see how the form is very inspired by the previous experience with ABS plastic. You have these kind of infinite curved structures, metal structures. And it was really hard to actually mechanize this thing, almost impossible. So we realized that this was a little bit of a rabbit hole, right? So you basically this history of using plastic is actually giving you a little bit of the blindness and you have to rethink the topology of how you build it if you want to mechanize that. So the topology that we use today looks different, but it has the same, what is the important characteristic? It's the mesh size, right? So basically that this surface here is small enough such that the concrete doesn't come out, but the other topology actually are kind of free to choose. And I just want to illustrate how this looks in the process now. So the, there's a tool, a specific tool head, we're going to talk about this in a second, that is basically being led by the, by the robot arm in 3D space, and it has in essence four function. It pulls in a six millimeter rebar, it welds it into the, into the spot, and then cuts it, and also locally, can, uh, locally bends it into the shape you want. Now, as I said, so basically this takes quite a bit of engineering to do that, and this is in essence the, uh, the, the process-specific tool that we had to engineer to do that. It's, it's like version three, however you want to number that, I would say. And it's like a mini factory, it has, it has a lot of functions, as I said, in a very tight volume and weight constraint. And this is exactly also often something you will run into when you do mobile uh, machines, so that you have a limited space, you have limited volume for the payload of the robot, but also very importantly, because you want to build something. So down here, right, you want to go into the mesh, so you don't want that this collides. And this um, gives us a lot of headaches if you engineer this kind of thing, so there's lots of stuff that has to go in there. And you really basically have to kind of um, uh, like iterate over the ideas, and this is kind of a push-pull effect. And I want to 
kind of illustrate the, the, some of the, the ways how we can do that with the, in the welding clamp here. So this, this, is, the, this is the welding um, clamp that goes down here and welds the, uh, the, the, the nodes here. This has to produce a lot of force when it's closed, and it has to retract far such that it doesn't collide with the mesh when you move and gives you design freedom. And so and it has to do this fast. And this is actually a very tricky design exercise. So we do this with what we call a four bar linkage. So you see four bars in essence. And the tricky part is now you have to decide on the length and on the positions of the, bar, of the bars and the, the joints respectively. Now the way how we did that is that you cannot handle this really by, by hand anymore. So the way you can do that is actually asking the computer uh, for help by transcribing that uh, problem into a more abstract problem, very abstract, basically just have abstract abstraction for the joints and the lengths, and then you optimize over that with a nonlinear optimization procedure. And this is the key, in essence, to, to get the functionality, the multiple functionality, that you, the multiple requirements of uh, kinematics and force into that in the right uh, way. You also have to use things like FVM analysis and things like that, which probably many of you are familiar with, right? Because you need to do it uh, in the same time strong and, and light. Uh, uh, yeah, and so this is basically the, the little curved, you'll see it has a specific shape, right? So the curved uh, structure of, of the welding clamp. Now, the big take home message is the following also, that something that we learned and I think we have been hearing ringing in the discussions is that you cannot do what in sometimes in our community we call over the wall engineering. So where someone comes up with a spec sheet and then tosses it over the wall to the design engineer, they do something uh, for a year and then come or half a year, come back and they have the perfect tool for you. It will not work because you, are, you don't understand in the beginning what you actually need. So as it turns out, you basically have to all the domain experts, the architects, the material scientists, structural engineers, the robotics have to sit together and iterate over that to home in on what you really need. And this is really, this is the very early um, prototype that did the curved structures was about this size. And this is of the course about, of about three years, uh, a lot of work of a, a lot of talented people that went into understanding that. And then if you do this well, you come up with a process that actually is both uh, functional, practical, and does everything you need. Now in principle, you can with this process, you can build very beautiful, nicely doubly curved steel meshes. Um, you then have to fill that with concrete and uh, Robert is here, so the, our resident um, concrete uh, magician. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask him. There's different ways you can do that. There's different aspects, of course, material science is important here. Um, then there's a manual surface treatment. So here we elected to do shot, uh, a shotcrete layer. First layer that is uh, then uh, traveled by hand laying rough and then another layer comes on top of it that gives it like a very smooth surface and you will see this wall actually today when you go and see uh, the nest prototype right so this is part of a bigger construction project so here you see the wall in the prototype the STC columns the smart slab so it's a part of a bigger structure come come back to that but I want to briefly talk about sensing and localization so right I said that the robot has to understand uh, where these are even more importantly actually the relevant thing is not the robot the relevant thing is the end effect, right? The tooling, the manufacturing process. So where is this thing in the world? So this is the first coordinate system the, the build, in respect to the building plan. But the second one is uh, where it is in respect to the, um, like the work piece it is, has been building and it's working on. And these two coordinate systems are different, right? One is local, one is more global. And you have to kind of align the two. But also, if you do so, it actually gives you an advantage because now you can actually, when you measure locally where your workpiece is and you can compare it to your global coordinate system, you can see if you have errors, right, between the as-built and the as-planned. And you can do something smart about that. You can feed that back into your design algorithm, change on the fly. But what you have to do from the engineering point, if you to do enable that, you have to do bespoke process specific sensing. So what we have to do here is a, a, this global measurement system. This was a bit more, so it's a bit more straightforward. So this is down, look from below to the tool. This is a downward facing camera that looks at this laser, uh, this uh, QR tags. Um, so it's like a barcode that is fitted at the base plate. Um, if you pay attention today when you go to construction, you still see them a little bit under the dust. Um, and so this gives the global reference. And then the second one, which was actually more work is more sophisticated, I would say, is a stereo camera pair that looks forward into this mesh structure. And Manuel, Manuel Lucy and my team 
built a whole algorithm that is in essence able to detect the wires as you build them, and then if you use this information and feed it back, and Katrin Dörfler, the architect who was working on that, can then use this and correct her design on the fly to meet the geometric target, like this wall has to end up somewhere, it has structural properties that it has to fulfill and so on. Now, you might think that this is all only relevant if you want to do mobile robotics and you think, well, this is relevant for me because I have a gantry system or whatever, absolute good. As it turns out, if you go to these really massive uh, systems that the people are proposing, it's more like a mobile system as well. So even though this system, this is the RFL, is built in a super, it's like especially stiff, you see it here, the robots in principle have very, very good sensing. It turns out if you go into this workspace, which is about 5,000 cubic meter, you get errors in the centimeter range, right? And this is because you have a really bad error uh, um, uh, buildup. You have deflections, the building actually moves, this thing is hanging on the building. You have deflections depending on the load case, and so basically you don't get the milli sub-millimeter precision that you're normally used to in a thing like that. And you will not be able to engineer this in, it's impossible, right? That's as far as you can get, it gets super heavy. Now, you can also use this end effector uh, uh, um, this end effect uh, oriented sensing here, right? So basically what you would do, you put in, and you see this in the, in the RFL, if you pay attention, there's little uh, beacons on the side, they have little blinky lights. It's a laser being um, shot out and there's, re uh, there's uh, receptors at the end effect and you can in essence measure globally where you are. And we spent quite a bit of time to make this very, very useful to the uh, users of the RFL. So Lukas Stadelmann who was working on that, built the whole software framework where it's very easy to define tool, fr tool frames on the fly. It's very easy to calibrate and then basically you get a very, very flexible global coordinate system. And Lucas is demonstrating this here basically. By, so he's measuring the, the uh, workpiece frame and now basically can say go and the robot goes there. Now we can also use this, uh, the calibration that we did before to correct. So you see kind of a little, so it goes there with the global uh, information and then corrects locally. And as you can see in a second, so basically what this allows you now, because you have these different frames and you can do online correction with that, you can actually kind of go and move this around and ask the robot just to basically go to that coordinate frame that I have defined before. And because it has moved now, the robot knows in essence where to go and knows how to correct locally. And you see that basically you get now submillimeter precision because of this global coordinate system and the, the way how you can set up these um, frames. Now, I want to basically alert you to the fact how this is done. So basically it's sense, then correct. So it's basically in two steps, right? So because this is what we call a static correction, it's not a dynamic correction. This is useful for many things, but let's say you want to do a long tool pass, so you want to do some milling, that's not going to help, right? Because you want to do, you want to basically constantly readjust. Or if you want to go into a structure where you have very, very tight space, very tight boundary constraints, you, might, you, might do, you cannot go there and then correct because you might already colliding with something. So now you can actually um, add some things that is, is now something very mature in the robotics field. So it basically makes all the drones flying around, which is in essence what I would call landmark inertial sensor fusion, which combines kind of the best of two worlds of type of fusion. So there's two types of, two types of sensing position. One is landmark-based, so in essence it's, it's what you do with your eyes. In technology it's usually done with lasers, cameras, can also be done with ra radar, or, uh, ultra band radio signals. Now the advantage of that, it gives you um, a global coordinate, a global estimate that doesn't drift, right? So basically my eyes have these landmarks, I know where I am in space. The disadvantage, especially in technology, that this is usually slow, and so you have a delay in there, 200 milliseconds, which means we cannot do tight feedback loops over them. There's another way of doing that, which is inertial sensing, and this is in essence your inner ear, right? So you're, what, you, what you have. And um, the good thing about that is much quicker, so it gives you much quicker information. In technology, there's of course an IMU, every cell phone has one of those, they're relatively cheap and powerful by now. Now, the disadvantage is the position estimate drifts, right? So basically, you can convince yourself of this fact. If you close your eye and turn around and you try to point to that chair, you will not hit it, right? This is because your estimate where you are position drifted, um, but it's fast. And so the idea behind landmark inertial sensor fusion is that you combine the two to get the best of the two worlds, so fast and globally accurate sensing. And this is in essence what we added to that system. And this is demonstrated here in this setup where 
We're simulating some kind of a process force that is not known to the robot. And we're adding an IMU, this little orange box here. And so we're combining all that sensing and do sensor fusion over that. And now on the left side, you see the non-corrected one. On the right one, you see the corrected one. And now you see the force kind of act, starting to act. And you see how the, the tip here starts to deviate, right? Actually up to like five uh, millimeters here. While on the right side, we are like submillimeter precision right on the tool pass that we want to do. Now this, of course, even can get more extreme when you go to mobile systems, but this is exactly the same principle. It's actually almost the same algorithm. So we have a relatively thin layer that is bespoke, that is bespoke and then we have a lot of like generic mathematical um, uh, code blocks that we can use. And then you can actually also do this on, on mobile systems, and you can see that now this can be moved around and we can nicely stabilize the end effector here. Now, very interestingly, you can also augment humans with that, right? So basically, when I started uh, basically interacting with uh, Matthias and Fabio, the first thing we did is, was an in-situ version of the uh, brick wall process, right? Because and the, the kind of the hypothesis was, well, this is something that cannot be done by hand, right? Or not, at least not in the time frame that you want because humans are not precise enough and so on. But now if you give this tool to a human, so, um, so here's the sensor in the inertial uh, um, system, and we're adding basically recognition of the blocks that you want to stack and the computer tells the human where to stack that block in space, all of a sudden the human can actually do what before only robots could do. So you augment the human, you give them additional capabilities, all of a sudden they can do that. This is, I think for me this is a huge potential, right? I mean, this, for me this is also digital fabrication. This is also um, additive manufacturing, right? With, uh, and, and that might actually be a sweet spot for certain applications. And, um, fingers crossed, we're going to hopefully see that soon in a real application as well. So you see, it of course still takes a while, right? Um, but of course, that's just, so this is not an overhead goggle. So yeah, you see here the, the precision at the end the, of the final structure. Um, but these things, I think, can be sped up and made more easy to use for the person, which will then basically mean the person can do this actually even faster. All right, so basically now um, I'm going to close this bracket and show basically how we can take this out of the laboratory. So um, the deployment on the nest construction. And uh, to, as a reminder, right, the mesh mold wall that you're going to see in a second being built up is all part of a bigger building, comes a hundred ton life load on top of it. And here's a little video how the mesh was being built on the construction site. So it was building a 12 meter long, three meter high steel cage. It was putting in 22,000, over 22,000 welding nodes in about 125 hours of total construction time, pulled in about 4,000 meters of uh, six millimeter rebar. And as you can see, so this is uh, a load-bearing structure. Here's the happy architects um, testing their structure. Um, here is the picture of the wall being filled, or uh, having been filled, uh, not with the final surface treatment yet, so that is still missing. Um, that comes at the very end, so that doesn't get damaged. Um, just a word on the accuracy, right? So basically, we managed to, uh, to build this accurate, uh, with an accuracy of below two centimeters for 90, uh, uh, almost 98% of the nodes. Um, to about 70% 70, 70 we were in an accuracy below one centimeter. And you can see that the most error we had on the very top in the strong, most strongly curved section, where because of the, the, the steel process basically, um, it was a little bit relaxing. And so this is, a, this is the take home message, right? Whenever you build additively, we'll have errors. And, but now if you have a feedback process, both locally in the design process and then also the other um, uh, things that come on top, like the smart slab, could actually adjust to that imprecision because it was basically being designed uh, digitally as well. So basically they could adjust that and basically recreate their building plan. You can make this nicely fit. And here is in essence a picture, sorry, of the uh, smart slab of Benjamin Nindelburger with the mesh mold wall. Uh, a few uh, nice shots here by Michael Irnman um, that show 
the interface between these two beautiful uh, digitally produced artifacts. Now I want to say a word about the nuts and bolts, the hardware integration, right? Whenever basically you do high performance systems, which the tool head is one, but also for example, leg systems like that, you would typically go to what we call commercial off the shelf systems or a components, so a catalog. The reason for that is that they have dependable performance. High performance, they have been tested and used, so they give us what we need. Um, you know, sens sensing, uh, sorry, sensing, actuation, and so on. The problem is that if you build it like this, it gets often big and clunky, right? Because you cannot, your actuator is always either a little bit too big or a little bit too small. Look at this, uh, the, 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 the scissors down here, it's like this big chunk of metal that is in essence completely not what we need, but it's just what we could get off the shelf. Now, um, here is another way how you could do that. Could you just actually pass me? So if you have the chance to visit uh, MOOC down at the stand, so this is also additive manufacturing. So this is actually laser synthetic actuator, which is a drop-in replacement for that leg drop that you have seen. It's 600 grams. It's basically the biggest part of it, the gray part is laser centered, produces 5,000 newtons of force, it's completely watertight, and has all the sensing and actuation in there. And I think this is really this kind of technology, so this parallelizes actually the use of additive manufacturing in this field, is actually the key to enable or to bring into realization this uh, in situ fabricators or other kind of sophisticated on site systems because they have to become much more light in order to be really truly useful. They have to become even more flexible, even more powerful, right? That we can actually do reasonable things. The current in situ fabricator weighs 1,400 kilos, while normal way, uh, loading in a residential building in Switzerland is 500 kilos, right? So we, wanna need, we need to build those systems much lighter than we can do with the off the shelf components. Then, um, just one uh, word about this aspect of planning and control. So in engineering, we very often do this in like separate blocks, but of course, this is not how humans, intelligent beings do that. They do this in a much more tight way. So basically, they completely always parallel in a parallel way. And for me, this is kind of a working um, operational definition of intelligence that we have to strive for. And you might ask, what is so hard about making robots interact? I cannot just take a leg robot, give it some kind of a power drill, and make it do useful things. Why is this a hard problem? And it has to do with the fact that you have a, a, a little system like that, right? It has many degrees of freedom, many motors. You have to tell every millisecond each motor what it needs to do. You have position requirements, you have forces playing in, and this actually turns out to be a very, very hard problem to coordinate all of that on the fly. Now, of course, you could uh, say, well, we could teleoperate, but the problem is if you come to very complex systems like humanoid robots, Teleoperation, this is not a standstill, it's actually a video. So you guys, someone teleoperating a complicated humanoid robot and you see how slow things get. So you probably don't want to do a construction pro project like that, right? So you either have to augment the humans or, or giving them other tools. And if, in particular also, there's many things that have to play into that and we want to give these tools to non-domain experts, construction workers, right? Architects are also not domain experts. We want to shield you guys from the complexity of all these things that are going on so that you can focus on the creativity at what you want to do with it, right? You shouldn't be bothered with basically programming, you know, all the, the, the motors and, uh, you know, collision checking, all these kind of things. And again, we can basically ask the robot, the computer for help. So this is basically using non linear optimal control where we basically can generate motion plans, optimal motion plans and controls on the fly. And you can see here, so uh, this is a nicely coordinated turning maneuver with very complicated constraints from the wheels and the legs, and they can just tell the robot, well, go there in a certain position and the computer will come up with the plan. This is, of course, very important for, like, if you have tooling constraints, like a pass, and, for example, the in-situ fabricator is a tracked vehicle, which makes it really hard to kind of combine those two things. Um, and very importantly, also, we would, like, again, things have to be bespoke to the given machine, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And we have been applying those things to a, a large range of different robots where basically in a nutshell, the same algorithm runs on all these different systems, right? So basically that we can quickly adjust this to, to other systems. So this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I have shown you a little bit, I've tried to tease out what is specific about the construction site. What does that mean for the engagement and development of technology? Um, I have juxtaposed this against these basic um, robotic systems functions, and we have seen an example, which is the 
uh, mesh mold process with the in-situ fabricator, and I think this is a nice illustration of all these things, right, which basically people are putting up as advantages of uh, digitally enabled uh, fabrication. And in general, I think, um, I hopefully this is a, a nice example of a robot that can act as this and fabricate for us on our behalf. And I think all of that, in a uh, uh, if we zoom out again, is a huge potential for society, not only in construction, but elsewhere. But it is, of course, a huge challenge for robotics research. And I'm coming to my last and most favorite slide, which are, in essence, all the talented people that really made this happen. And I want to just highlight that fact again, how interdisciplinary this has to be. It should, it, this is not an option, okay? So basically, I think you cannot do things like that in a single discipline. So all the domain experts have to sit on the table and work together and have the open mindset to work across disciplines. And then I think that's where actually this true innovation uh, will happen. With that, I'm at the end. And thank you so much for your attention early on a Friday morning. <clears throat>